Okay, so as you may see, I'm not Barney. Uh, Barney is on vacation in San Francisco and uh, I am his uh, substitution. And um, yeah, my name is Marvin Meyer. I'm uh, working at the LEA department for now roughly half a year and Oliver thought it is a good idea to let me explain to you the mighty bootstrapping ideas of his lectures and yeah uh, let's let's hope i can deliver the the content here so uh, yeah this is exercise number th number number six uh, we talk about today so um, maybe maybe a short recap to last week uh, in the uh, lecture you learned about the uh, multi-step bootstrapping algorithms and today in the first or the first task will deal with some yeah with the end step return method and uh, the second task will deal with the eligibility trace and yeah as you can see here already we deal now not with the racetrack anymore but with a new environment called the inverted pendulum this is shown here um, so the idea is that we have this inverted pendle and the goal is to bring it in the upper equilibrium and we can do this by applying a torque here at the yeah at this angle and yeah the task is to stabilize it and we will see that we can uh, access this environment in the same manner we did uh, with the race car track and for that first of all we need to uh, so maybe maybe for the for the uh, exercise in general i will not uh, do like uh, so so Barney did like the programming here at the laptop and uh, took there some time but I thought uh, due to the complexity of the algorithms and also it's not that efficient if I do the debugging here live in front of you I just go through the solutions we can talk about a little bit of the idea behind the algorithms and yeah, later on have a look at some results and if you have any questions just throw them in and um, yeah so we will just have a look at the solutions you already uh, could have um, yeah access them on on github i hope you uh, utilize this and yeah so back to back to the notebook here um, we need to install the gymnasium uh, library uh, this is done uh, in before and so i made sure that it works here on my uh, laptop uh, we import some packages here and yeah as i said we use the inverted pendulum uh, environment this is um, yeah the one pendulum v1 here and if you want to learn further or want to get more into detail about the uh, yeah, environment itself, I've linked you the documentation page of the uh, farmers, uh, farmer organization here where you can find some more details about the environment, some description of it. There are a lot more of environments uh, we can utilize for our algorithms and also uh, the source code you can find here on github uh, where if you are interested can have a look into the details how they implemented this environment okay so uh, we can run this code here and you see that it pops up and this is just some uh, random actions on the environment and we see that the pendulum swings kind of from the left to right and as i said we will utilize the algorithms we learned so far in order to uh, stabilize it in the upper position uh, before we can apply our yeah, discussed algorithms uh, we first need to discretize the action and uh, state space 
because uh, our algorithms we learned so far in the or discussed so far in the uh, lecture je, yeah, need discretized action and state spaces and therefore the idea here is um, or the first task was to uh, discretize the state space. So the uh, pendulum here has a continuous state space and uh, we can apply a continuous action on this environment. And what we see here is yeah, some information about the environment. Um, we can see here the borders, also the, the um, constraints for the x-axis, the y-axis. So this is, uh, so the first, the first state is the x-axis uh, regarding the pole tip of our, uh, of our pendle. The second state is the uh, y-axis when respond, uh, so, so, so corresponding to the pole tip. And the last state is the angular velocity of our environment. And these are the constraints for each state. And we also see here that we can apply an action. Uh, yeah, an action. This is the torque. And uh, yeah, we can apply two Newton meters in, uh, yeah, with uh, yeah, two Newton meters. And we are, yeah, um, first, first task was uh, the discretization state uh, to, to write this discretization state method. And um, we can see that the discretization intervals are given by d theta, d omega, and dt. And also we need to continualize the action of our uh, agent, uh, which outputs like an yeah, discrete value here, and this should be mapped to a uh, torque uh, that we apply. And first question, first question was, um, should we choose an odd or an even number of dis discretization intervals? And yeah, the solution, I guess this is kind of obvious, uh, was that uh, indeed we should use an odd number of discretization steps because we want the agent to be able to stabilize within an yeah within an yeah discrete state uh, because if we choose an even number for the uh, for the discretization we would have for the sine of um, for the sine of theta at the uh, at point zero uh, we would have like an uh, yeah, jiggling, jiggling around the states. Yeah, I don't know how to say that. Um, and this is the code. This is the code. We will later have a look at the uh, discretization diagrams. I think that makes it more clear uh, how this, uh, how we can apply that. So these are the um, the algorithms, or this is the uh, functions we came up here. Um, maybe a quick note here to the. Uh, implementation itself. Um, normally when we would write code, uh, hopefully nobody does it this way here because this is really, really compromised code itself. You would start at one state and try to think about, okay, how can I incorporate the intervals? How can I uh, make a uh, list for that? And after, after you have come up with an idea, then in the next state you can think about okay how can I compromise uh, how can I compromise my function and here we use uh, list comprehensions in the first place and later on um, the NumPy library provides us with, uh, with a digitized function uh, where you can yeah um, floor the continuous values and discretize it and this is uh, quite quite handy for our application here. And also the function for the continualized action. Um, yeah, we can see here that it takes the discrete actions and yeah, just maps it to the uh, according, according continuous action. I guess this is uh, straightforward. 
And um, when we run this, we can see here that, again, uh, when we output the values, we see, okay, discrete action of zero is then a continuous action of minus two, and so on and so forth. I think this was not a big challenge, hopefully. Uh, I mean, it might take some time, but I guess it's solvable. Uh, here, as I said, um, in the case of, so, so what is shown here in this diagrams are the uh, discretizations. Uh, so the discretization uh, diagrams where we can see, okay, cosinus theta in a continuous uh, interval. And here are the discrete states for it. And we see if we use an odd number of states, we have here um, yeah, state seven, which is, yeah, uh, zero and this is quite nice because otherwise we would uh, have like an, a state between uh, six and seven and um, yeah, this makes it easier for the agent to learn or for us to interpret the results. Yeah, the discretization diagrams for the angular velocity and also for the torque, I think they are also both quite, uh, yeah, quite nice to see. Um, but now let's, yeah, let's have a look at task, task number three, where we want to apply the end step methods. And maybe, maybe to give, give you a short recap on the end step, end step methods. I hope you can all see that. Uh, we, we heard in the last lecture that the end step methods is somewhere between the Monte Carlo and the temporal difference learning. And the idea was that uh, for some task, at least for a non-episodic task, Monte Carlo is not that idle because we would have to wait till the episode terminates. And for continuous tasks, this is just not possible. And otherwise, uh, or so the idea was, okay, we could use bootstrapping and just make one look ahead and then update the action values and somewhat it still converges to an optimum with um, uh, infinitely many experiences. And um, the idea of the end step bootstrapping is now to have like some sort of in between. So we maybe want to wait five steps, 10 step, 20 steps. This is depending on our application, but it makes it maybe a bit more, yeah, yeah, depending on the application, it is helpful to have this, this feature. And it gives us a more, yeah, um, uh, an hyperparameter where the uh, engineer can choose between, okay, do I want to look uh, far in the future or do I want to have like a narrow sighted agent? And uh, this algorithm, uh, as uh, Daniel said, I don't know how, how much I should go into detail here, but uh, since, it is, um, since, it is, since it is implemented in Python below, I just uh, brush uh, a little bit over it and um, you can just interrupt me if you have any questions here. So I guess the initial, uh, initialization of both the uh, uh, state action values and um, yeah, the first state is quite, um, quite uh, yeah, trivial, I would say. Then we have our for loop, which iterates over the episodes. Uh, as I said, we initialize the states and we choose an action. And then we start each episode and um, yeah, we iterate within the episode. We do a step-by-step -step calculation. We choose an action, we store the transition, we store the reward. And um, what we see here in the end step method is or what we calculate here is this tau. And this tau just means when we, when we uh, start our agent, uh, it makes a step, uh, we collect the rewards and it does another step, we make the rewards, but we do not update, we do not update our um, state value estimates uh, in the first place, but we wait for like 10 steps. So the agent is somewhere over here. And after the 10th uh, iteration, we go ahead and say, okay, now we want to update the state values here. And then the agent does another step and uh, we 
take a look at the uh, next state values we want to update and it just iterates over them. Yeah, and this is just implemented in the code. So this is all this, this code says here. And um, yeah, we have to ensure since we do on policy training that the uh, policy, maybe just to say that the policy is epsilon greedy. Uh, so uh, that we uh, ensure that we uh, explore the state space. Yeah, and this is implemented here in the code. So we initialize our action values. Um, we initialize our policy. And yeah, then as you can see here, we start iterating over the episodes. We uh, yeah, we construct our lists in which we want to store the states, action, and rewards. And um, we will uh, initialize a discount array here in order to uh, efficiently compute the rewards uh, afterwards. And then the and this is why, why I don't want to do this in, in person here or uh, live in, in the coding is because of this uh, uh, these indices. It is not that easy to come up with this solution. Uh, so we need to construct this tau here with the indices. And uh, this might be some, yeah, sometimes you just need time to, to debug those things. And um, yeah, so maybe maybe to go over the code here, uh, we get our our um, discrete actions. We continualize the action, then we put this continuous action into the environment. We get the state, we get a reward, and we get this termination flag. Then we discretize the states. We put them into our yeah storage, I would say. And since it is not terminated, we do another or until it is terminated, we do another action. Then, um, yeah, as I said, this is epsilon greedy. So we choose like, okay, is it between zero and one? If not, then yeah, go for, go on. And yeah, let's see here, you know, so this tau, um, so this is like this delayed this delayed state value update I talked about. So it runs, it, it is just this delayed update and, with, and if tau gets bigger than zero, then we start updating our, uh, our state values. And this is just done here in this slide. So we get our uh, n last rewards uh, then we use the discounted array to construct our target. And then we use this target together with the forgetting factor in order to uh, yeah, update the target. And then uh, calculate the state values uh, based, on, based on the normal, the, normal, uh, uh, yeah, the normal state value update rule. Okay, and uh, if we run, run this through, I could, could have run this through here too, but um, since it takes some time to evaluate this code, uh, I just show you here the graph and what we see is that it nicely, nicely converges and it is also able to stabilize, I hope, hopefully it is able to stabilize uh, the pole in an upwards position. Let's have a look here. Hey. Hey, okay, yeah. So uh, in, in this cell, uh, I just run here. This is just the greedy execution. So as I said, in training, you want to have like this epsilon greedy. And when you, yeah, when you want to uh, perform uh, on real environments, you just turn off the epsilon and have like your learned policy. Okay. So this was the first part already of the exercise. And in the second part, we talk a bit about eligibility traces and recursive updates. And we call this the TD Lambda algorithm. So the idea of, um, let, me, let me quickly show the slides to that. So the idea of uh, maybe 
uh, instep returns and also lambda return. Uh, the idea of lambda return was not that we we, we have this forget, forgetting factor gamma, and we also have this, um, I would say, some sort of uh, weighting factor lambda, which weights the data we collect. So in order to ensure that the data which was most recently collected, we can say, okay, we want the lambda to be really, really low, then we would say, okay, um, all, all data points are equally weighted, but when we choose a lambda which is really high, we only want recent data to be, um, yeah, to be present in our policy or to to say, like, how would how would we say this like uh, this this uh, chess chess example where you say okay you have this checkmate move you have this checkmate move and. Um, this checkmate move gives you should be should be weighted much more higher than the steps before because this checkmate move is the one who will win the game and this is some sort of like um, the idea of this lambda return and both n step and lambda return lambda return is just the weighting of the data um, have like this forward view so we look uh, some steps ahead and then we update our state or state action values. And um, the question now is, okay, can we maybe implement this in a more efficient way, maybe some sort of recursively? And uh, yes, the answer to this is yes, we can. And here the idea is to use an eligibility trace and as I said, the idea is that we want to incorporate more recent data. So maybe the idea is the same, more recent data. If I'm in a state and the most, the state, so the states which was before the recent state, for before the current state I'm in, uh, these are the most important states. And this is the idea of this uh, eligibility traces. And, um, the code for that or the implementation is quite quite easy as I will show you later and um, we just have like this random or we have this initialization with zeros and then in each step we say okay um, the state in in which I'm currently in yeah this this one gets just an uh, update with one and all other states are slightly decayed. And uh, if I do this in this way, so this is like this, okay, I've visited a state, uh, the, the eligibility trace goes up, and then it just decays, 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 and then if I visit the state again, it goes up again. And the idea is that important states have like a higher value in this eligibility trace. And we use this ZK here in order to um, multiply it into our state value update or action value update, as you can see here, uh, in order to yeah, incorporate like this backward view and yeah, utilize TD0 here uh, for, our, for our purpose. And this is the code for, for this uh, eligibility trace. So uh, we now have uh, like an TD0 algorithm. So we just have our one step look ahead and then we bootstrap and uh, we use this eligibility trace here. Uh, we initialize it and then uh, like this is the code just from before. Uh, just uh, edit the eligibility trace here. So we update our eligibility trace. We say, okay, in which discrete state are we? And then we add up a one and all other states are decayed. And this is not only done in the initialization, but also here in each step. In every episode, 
we say, okay, in which state am I? And all other states get a little bit delayed. And in the end, what we can observe then, uh, we let this run for 5,000 episodes. This is a little bit longer than uh, than uh, in the other case. And what we see here is that the eligibility trace does not um, have like a really good outcome because, uh, so like the learning curve is much, much slower and it has a much higher variance when we compare it to the uh, TD, uh, NSTEP TD here. And uh, so, Maybe we can say that the eligibility trace does not perform as well uh, in this specific in this specific task because we just when we like pendle around at the bottom and um, we just look backwards, uh, we just look backwards and we like we just jiggling around here, then it does not have like uh, a huge impact. Uh, other or, or uh, so maybe when we use uh, n-step returns and uh, we we look into the future and we see okay ah maybe maybe here was a good action then the actions are getting updated uh, due to the the good actions here then uh, it has like a steeper learning curve and what we see here is it just takes longer for the agent to explore like these um, good state action values. And maybe, maybe now someone, uh, we, we could now argue, okay, um, here we have a lot of hyperparameters and this is also something I've added to the, to the uh, exercise. And uh, what we see here is that all of these are like uh, hyperparameters. So our lambda is the forgetting factor for our um, for our, uh, yeah for our, for our algorithm algorithm here, and the other ones are just typical values. So we can arbitrarily choose them uh, according to our problem. And what I've done here in this section here is that um, I don't know if you guys heard of the hyperparameter uh, optimization already, uh, but the idea is that um, for, for those kind of applications, we somewhat want to choose parameters or hyperparameters, which um, yeah, kind of uh, perform really well uh, on, on this um, specific task. And therefore, uh, I write here the function, which is just just the the code from before. But I say, okay, as um, as input value, you get the lambda here, and we want to uh, run this code for different lambdas and maybe see, okay, which one is the best? Yeah, and uh, normally those hyperparameter optimizations uh, use. So there are different methods, uh, obviously. Uh, some are like uh, random search or heuristic searches or uh, Bayesian optimization or even gradient-based. And the more efficient ones are definitely the gradient-based. In this case, I just did a small grid search and um, we can have a look at that here. So uh, I want to have like some different values of the uh, lambda which I tested out and I just do like an um, yeah, yeah I just uh, constructed here like a numpy uh, numpy array from uh, 1 to 0.9 uh, from from 0 to 0.9 and uh, I let it run like for 10 times and what we see here is the accumulated the mean accumulated reward over the training and what we see here is that for, um, for zero, it performs quite worse. Uh, this would be the equivalent to TD zero. Uh, and uh, this is not yeah, that much of an information here, but uh, what we can see uh, on the other hand is that when the value gets higher here, we want to maximize this obviously, uh, then we see that for a value of lambda, uh, point, point 0.8, yeah, I would say point 0.8 or point 0.9 here, we get the best results. And this is somewhat, um, I think, like a nice finding. 
yeah, quick and dirty. Um, this would be all I have to say to those um, to those methods. Do you guys have any questions regarding the end step methods, lambda returns, or even eligibility trace? Jaron? Uh, yeah, just with regard to the um, uh, elig uh, eligibility yeah. trace. Go ahead. It's not reset for every um, so for every event, not event, sorry, uh, every ask. I don't know how to call it the number of training steps. So you obviously run an event up to a termination. Yes. And you keep that eligibility, the eligibility trace. You don't then reset it after that. Yeah. So it wasn't covered in the lecture notes. Is that deliberately done? Is there a difference? Yeah, you should obviously, you should obviously, uh, you should obviously um, uh, reinitialize it with zeros after e or, I guess so. Yeah, after each. No, 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 no. Uh, over over one training, you. Yeah, over one training, you keep it. Yeah. You then into the next training step. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a look at the slides. Honestly, good question. Da I, a, a question I don't expect it. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Do we do we reset it? What be, what would be what would be the reasonable choice here? I guess we would reset it after. I mean, that could explain why my code doesn't work that well, honestly. Yeah, yeah, because I didn't. Yeah, and episodes. Maybe it has to be resetted here. Good question. So I, uh, in my code, it is not resetted, and honestly, my my gut tells me it has to be resetted. So maybe this function here should have been there. So it should look more like this one here. Yeah, we'll try this out. Honestly, I, I can't tell you the answer, but uh, since I'm the also the teacher of your next exercise, I will um, I will have a look into it and give you the answer to that. Further questions. No further questions? Is everything clear? Okay. I think then we have it. <laughs>